Hi, my name is Hannah Jane Pritchett, current U of A GIST master's student. Welcome to the University of Arizona GIST podcast. Our host is Chris Lukenbeal with guest Gutty Pataro, Chief Technology Officer and VP of Engineering for Badger Maps. Let's get started. Hello, my name is Chris Lukenbeal. I'm the director of the GIST programs here at the University of Arizona. And for this week's podcast, we have Gutty Pataru, who is the CTO and VP of Engineering for Badger Maps. And Gutty actually is a, what, a long-term, we could say, Arizona GIS um, community resident, even from afar now in Spain, which we'll get to in a bit, but was a graduate out of the ASU's um, geography department, both for his undergraduate and his graduate degree in the MAS GIS program, and then worked with uh, myself and Bob Balling and others up at ASU for a number of years as an um, affiliate faculty member for the MAS GIS program. And without you, the we would not have had some of the wonderful successful outcomes of students that we did um, for the period when you were there. So welcome, Gutty. Nice to have you here with us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Really appreciate it. So it seems like uh, your career has uh, really kind of taken, I want to say a circuitous path, but how about a global path might be a better way of saying it, um, that you began in, in Phoenix area, went off to San Francisco to kind of develop your own um, company and then have moved on since then. What, maybe you could tell us a little bit about your career tra trajectory. Um, maybe let's start with your work at Arizona State. What was your educational background and, and um, how did you get into GIS in general? Was it through higher education or was it through work? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I guess, I guess it really all started when I was in my undergrad at ASU. Um, I took a, I was still undecided at the time, but I was coming up against my limit for being undecided. Um, so I had to make some decisions and it was either history or something else. And luckily I took a geography course um, and, uh, and I heard about GIS, which kind of got me really interested. Uh, during that geography course. So I decided, okay, I'm going to, you know, get my bachelor's degree in geography um, with basically, uh, um, I think it was like a GIS certificate is what they considered it at the time. It wasn't an undergrad um, or, a, or a second degree or anything. It was like a, with a focus in GIS. Um, so that, that was really where it all started. Uh, also during my, my undergrad, I also um, did an internship at the city of Phoenix. Um, as basically like a, you know, a GIS technician um, or a GIS technician's assistant, I guess is what you can call it. Um, but it was really great exposure, especially, you know, going, going to class and learning about GIS, which is which this brand new thing that I thought was really interesting because I'd always liked computers and maps and sort of put those together was really cool to me. But then, you know, going to class during the day and then you know, in the morning and then in the afternoons going and actually like applying what I was learning. I thought that that was really cool. Um, and it was just a really great way to, uh, you know, to really kind of like directly put my new skills to use on a regular basis. Um, and then, you know, towards the end of my bachelor's, I was kind of deciding, okay, you know, do I just keep working? Do I look for a job? Um, and that was when it was basically the third year of the MAS GIS program uh, was was coming around. And I thought, what a great opportunity. Um, you know, it was a one year program. It was all at night. So by that time, I was working full time with the city of Phoenix. So uh, as a GIS technician, um, you know, graduated from being an intern to, you know, to full time. And uh and so that, that was really, you know, it was kind of a no-brainer to me. Take one more year of school, do it at night um, while I was working during the day and, and just continue to kind of develop those skills. Um, and, uh, and yeah, you know, and then in terms of, I guess, that's really where my career path kind of ended up going a different direction, right? I, I, I started off as kind of a GIS technician, you know, mostly making maps, working with GIS data, 
basically creating the you know the 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 land maps for the for the city of Phoenix, um, and working on you know utility maps and utility permits and things like that, um, and that that kind of uh, it took a turn during the MASGIS program and we started learning about um, programming and specifically programming, uh, you know, like in customizing ArcGIS uh, and, and the Esri environment with custom tools, like being able to build custom tools and automate repetitive tasks. Mm -hmm. um, and then as well as getting into web development. So building applications with Google Maps, right? That, that to me was like the coolest thing. Um, you know, because only a couple years earlier, I mean, I'm, I'm an old fart at this point, you know, because I, I remember when, uh, you know, when like Google Maps came out and Google Earth and, you know, driving directions on your phone and all of those things were still very new and kind of groundbreaking concepts at the time. And I, I really, I wanted to ride that wave, you know. Um, so, so yeah, so uh, my, my thesis in MASGIS ended up being what I called QAQC automation for a municipality's GIS data, which was kind of a fancy way of saying, you know, I'm, I'm gonna try to build some tools around real world workflows that I experience at work, right? Which, and those workflows were basically doing the quality control and quality assurance of whenever you, you know, you make changes to the map, to the map base, um, that needed to be reviewed by somebody and they go through a set of you know 30 manual steps um to do it and i was like let's try to let's try to automate this like let's put some of some of these skills to use and see what we come up with um luckily it actually went pretty well um i i know you know there was some pushback in terms of the early adopters of the tool because they'd been doing this manually for 20 30 years and they didn't want to change um, but you know, it was definitely it was definitely at the very least a really cool experience for me to go, okay, wow, like GIS is actually more than just making maps. It's actually encompasses this whole sort of world of IT and this world of programming that is really there to, you know, you can you can have a job making maps, but you can also have a job making it easier for other people to make maps and making it easier you know, for, to, you know, to make uh, GIS professionals jobs easier and create, create tools that actually, you know, bring efficiency to organizations. Um, and that, that was really kind of the direction that I ended up going. So based directly on that tool that I built, um, you know, I started doing more development. I, you know, I moved around to a couple different departments at the city of Phoenix. Um, and my job became more and more focused on either building these tools um, and then eventually bringing these tools to the internet, right? So bringing these maps and these, you know, that, oh, instead of opening arc map and interacting with a map and getting information, starting to actually use the new, some of the new Esri tools that were out there to bring it to the internet. Um, and so I, I kind of made the jump from GIS technician to um, analyst programmer, essentially. So I, you know, I, I became a programmer by title, um, which, which I just found to be, again, super interesting. And at the same time, so, you know, by at the same time, I was still going back to ASU at night, not to not to learn it, but to teach um, yes. in the MASGIS program. Um, and I, you know, and, and it was kind of the opposite then, where instead of learning at ASU and then applying it directly on the job. I was now learning on the job and kind of applying it directly to ASU and like teaching the students and bringing them these real world examples because those were so helpful to me. Um, and, uh, and yeah, and that, you know, that went on for, for five, you know, essentially five years um, teaching, you know, teaching at ASU. I was teaching the, the, the two programming classes. One of them is web development. The other one was like desktop development with Python and uh you know arc objects um we also got into um some ArcGIS server stuff i remember chris you and i and uh, and rudy strickland we set that up for asu the whole kind of ArcGIS server infrastructure oh yeah um yeah, yeah the early adopters was, of the um amazon cloud systems too for a server yeah right yeah, yeah yeah getting on aws yeah that was that was that was a lot of fun i mean we yeah. we uh 
the, the, the projects that the students were able to do, you know, having that technology, I think was really, it was really kind of huge, right? Because it went from just, just being able to write very simple kind of like JavaScript sort of web mapping applications using Google Maps um, to now they could, they could really tie in all of the rest of their curriculum using ArcGIS products. Um, they can now finally tie that in and actually put all that on the web too. So, yeah. so the projects went from being these really kind of, you know, almost very sort of basic web mapping applications to, um, to some of them were very robust and they did, you know, yeah. different analysis and displayed results. And, you know, they had uh, jobs that were running in the background overnight, like churning data so that the next day they were updated. Um, I was I was really impressed with uh, with what the students were doing there um, in in, uh, in you know in that program and I'm and I'm sure you've just kind of carried that on at at a uh, at, at uh, UVA as well. You know, I I kind of remember. Maybe correct me if I'm wrong, but weren't you involved at the city of Phoenix early on with one of the Sky Harbor web maps for the terminals? Yeah. So that was. Um, yeah, so I essentially worked in three different departments at the city of Phoenix. Uh, I was a GIS technician and a senior GIS technician in the, it's called the engineering and architectural services department. They're the ones that basically do all the cadastral maps. So, you know, if you, if you're, a, if you're a developer or anything, you, you need to go and find these maps, look at utility permits. Um, so I was involved in that uh, for a few years. And then I moved to the uh, streets and transportation department. Um, you know, basic, very similar, similar things, but all about the roads and the streets and, uh, and, um, but that, that's where I really got more exposure working with, working with great people like, um, uh, yeah, like the, you know, the GIS manager there and things like that, learning directly from them. Also working with other GIS programmers, um, to kind of learn sort of best practices. Yeah. Um, but that, that's really where I started kind of taking sort of desktop programming more to the web um, and getting more of that web yes. development experience. And then, yeah, the, the, the third and final department I was at uh, the city of Phoenix before I moved to San Francisco to, to, to work with, you know, co-found a startup. Um, that was with the, uh, the, the basic, yeah, the aviation department. Um, so I was working at primarily with Sky Harbor Airport. Um, and it was mostly all web and mobile development by that point. So, um, so yeah, yeah, a couple of the projects that I'm most proud of from there are, were uh, basically they're, you know, they're, they didn't, Sky Harbor Airport never had a mobile website. So, you know, there, there was no, if you went to skyharbor.com on your, on your phone, it looked like garbage. Um, so we, you know, basically I, I was, I was part of the team that built the first Sky a uh, mobile website for Sky Harbor Airport, nice. and a big part a big part of that uh, that I was heavily involved in was the um, the terminal maps. So restaurants, shops, uh, where's the closest bathroom, things like that, and and we built all that out using um, ArcGIS server. We did a lot of a lot of caching. We um, used used a lot of the ArcGIS server, you know, JavaScript APIs for things like that. Um, and we, and we, we built out, uh, yes, a, kind of a, a really cool tool. Yeah. And so, and, and the, you know, so the second project that I was really proud of at Sky Harbor was, uh, which is still up. I'm like very surprised that after, you know, all, all these years, it's been, I think like eight years now, eight, nine years, um, it's still running and it's basically a, a tool that we call find a spot, which is real time, um, real time parking help. Right. So, you know, you go on, you can, right. you can write on, right on Sky Harbor's website, you know, if you're driving up to the, to the airport, you can find right there, uh, like on your phone or, you know, on the internet, each parking lot, how full they are, uh, like where they recommend that you park based on like convenience, you know, the, the, how close it is to the terminal entrance versus like affordability. Um, yeah, you can see how many spots are open. And again, a big part of it was you can actually visualize all that on a map and, you know, and it changes each parking lot changes color based on uh, the availability and that kind of thing. So yeah, that, that one made me, uh, 
that that one made me I guess famous in Phoenix let's say for <laughs> I was I, I was definitely doing the the yeah like the the circuit of speaking at some of the local dev summits and the, yeah um yeah, and I think it was 2012 I spoke at the the big dev summit in uh uh Palm Springs you know and showed that one as well um yeah and the and the lightning talks you know with the the the, the big Esri conference in San Diego so yeah so that was yeah, that was that was uh, that was pretty cool. I was I was it was really it was really the first time that I had worked on something that I was really passionate about and interested in that I really liked, um, but that like also was kind of was public. Everything else had been internal use at Phoenix, uh, yeah. you know, at the city of Phoenix. This was really the first thing that was put out there publicly that like was essentially a utility to help people you know, get around the airport, which I thought, I thought was really cool. So was it the public exposure part that led you towards the San Francisco startup um, part of your career? Or was it more something that you had been desiring doing all your life, you know, or like yeah, what, so how do you make the transition from a GIS analyst technician developer at the city of Phoenix to a San Francisco based startup company? Right. Yeah, right. Yeah. So, so my last, you, you know, I was still an analyst programmer when I was at um, Sky Harbor Airport. So essentially, you know, a full-time web developer at that point, right. Or mobile, you know, working on some internal mobile apps as well. Um, so, you know, so by, by that point, that was kind of what I was doing, um, you know, along with kind of working at ASU, and, and it, again, I was I was young. I mean, I was in my twenties. I had a lot of energy at the time. I was also doing side work, like besides ASU and besides my full time job. I was also doing just a little bit of consulting on the side. You know, things that would come up, um, and and you know, kind of a you know, to make a long story short, there was a there was a essentially a Google Maps developer certification program that. It was one of those things that Google came out with and they let it run for a year or two. And then they basically were like, ah, this is useless. We're going to kill it. Um, but, you know, I, so I essentially became this Google Maps certified developer and, and, and uh, which didn't mean anything except that I was on some list. And sure enough, I was contacted by some random person on LinkedIn um, who basically said, hey, I have an idea for this startup. I'm, I'm an ex-Google sales guy. I was selling maps at, at, at Google, right? I was selling Google maps to companies and municipalities and government entities. Um, and, and I think that there's a lot of room in this space for innovation. Um, and I saw that you're on the list of Google maps developers. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, this list of like a few people, you know, he, I got contacted through that. Um, and essentially it started out as kind of a consulting engagement, like let's build out some interesting tools and see, you know, see where this goes. Um, pretty quickly, we started because of his contacts. Um, he, he's now the CEO and co-founder of, of, of our company. Um, but, uh, you know, through his contacts, we were actually able to, to land some pretty sized deals right up front. Um, so we started doing some consulting work and it was very quickly that it was pretty obvious that there was room for like a product, right? And, and, he, you know, he was really, he really wanted like a startup. He wanted to, he wanted to go through that kind of San Francisco startup experience. Um, I, I wasn't really super interested, you know, I, I mean, I, at that time, I really just, I was, you know, I was young. I was still fairly new in my career. I mean, I was only maybe seven or eight years in or something. And, and, you know, I was enjoying what I was doing. I had a lot of opportunity around between ASU and consulting and my full-time job. That I was, my mindset was very much like just keep an open mind, keep opportunities sure. open, and see what happens. You know, I, I didn't say no to a lot of things at that time. Um, and yeah, and you know, after a few months of just doing some consulting work for you know for them, uh, it basically turned into, hey, do you want to come on as a technical co-founder and essentially the first engineer, you know, and and the you know the technical side of uh, of this new startup. Um, and you know, my, my wife and I, we really liked, uh, San Francisco, like it, like it, it's a great city. We really love it out there. Um, 
And, and I was also kind of like, it felt like a crossroads where, okay, I can stay at the city and retire in my fifties or something, but there's not like, like I already, I already felt like the, you know, the, the containment of the city of Phoenix didn't really allow me to break into a lot of what I want to do. And I didn't want to work three jobs, you know, forever. Right. Um, so, um, so we, you know, we, we, we kind of did the pros and cons list and calculated the risk and we said, you know, why not? Let's, let's do it. Let's move to San Francisco. Um, which in hindsight, it was, it was very naive. I mean, we didn't have a company yet. Like we didn't really have a product or an idea, you know, at, at that time. Um, but all I knew is that like, I wanted to do it and like, I wanted to succeed and I, you know, and I wanted to give it a shot. And the worst case scenario is, you know, I crawl back to, to Arizona, kind of cleaning my wounds and, and just get back into the same old things I was already involved in. Um, that's that's kind of that's kind of how I saw it. Um, so, yeah, so I mean, yeah, we, you know, made the move out to San Francisco, um, started started Badger Maps, which, you know, we we knew essentially we started off almost like a, like a map, like a consulting company focused on mapping, focused on building maps, right? Web mapping, um, uh, especially. So I, at that time I was really doing mostly Google maps, API development, um, very little Esri involved. Like that started tapering off because for a startup, Esri just doesn't make sense. We don't have a lot of data to work with. It costs a lot of money. So that's that's when we started looking more into the open source um, kind of free yeah. uh, GIS, you know, geospatial technology that's out there. Um, and, and once, you know, within a few months, we decided to kind of go all in on this product, which is now the Badger Map, which, you know, we've, we've now been, we've had for almost eight or nine years now. Um, we, uh, at that at that time it was really like i knew the decision about technical stacks was a really important one because we're going to build on top of that and then it's really hard to migrate to other things and especially you know especially startups like like what i and what i didn't realize at the time either is that when but i i know it very intimately now is that as a startup it's all about it's all about speed right it's all about getting features and value into your customer's hands as quickly as possible. What that means is that it doesn't leave a lot of time for, you know, redoing technical decisions that we made years ago. Right. Yeah. So, um, you know, so, so essentially when the time came, um, I was already familiar with like Postgres SQL, post GIS, um, Google maps, API, there's a, there's a, you know, Py, the Python programming language, there's a, a web development framework on top of it called Django. Um, and Django has a geo component also called geo Django. Um, so all of those pieces fit really nicely together, you know, Postgres with Postgres, uh, um, uh, Django, geo Django and um, Google Maps API. And so that was essentially the tech stack, you know, that, that we started building our application on top of and, um, you know, over, over the course of eight years, we, we, uh, we've kind of iterated to kind of where we're at now, which is a much more mature product than it was then. Um, you know, a lot of phone calls to customers in between and, and that kind of thing. Um, but it's, it's been, uh, it's been, it's been really cool. And like, there was no way I don't, there was no way that I really could have like made the jump to a startup had I not had that previous experience either, yeah. you know, even all the way, even all the way back to my bachelor's degree, honestly, like I needed all of that GIS sort of background and, and, and base to work from um, before I could really like apply that in a way that a startup actually needs it to be applied, which is like very lean and very nimble and easy, you know, easy to, to work with and change and, and things like that, you know, things like the traveling sales problem. I mean, that's essentially what, that's what we solve. That's what yeah, my company I, solves. I was going to ask you that, like, um, for a bit of a 
background, like what is the main niche that Badger Maps fills? Like what, or Badger Mapping, what, what did you see you and your CIO see as like the main um, thrust that, hey, there's a market for us here, let's go fill it. What, what is that, what need did you see and what are you filling in the geospatial? Right. Yeah, so, um, so, you know, I guess it, it takes kind of an understanding of like CRM software, so customer relationship management software. Okay. Um, you know, which, which essentially, if you're working, uh, if you're working for any company that sells stuff, right, they're, so you're using Salesforce, or you're using Microsoft yeah. Dynamics, or Zoho, you know, there, there are a bunch of, of uh, CRM vendors out there now, but it's really just to track your customers and the pipeline, right? Because selling, so, selling something to a person, it's a, it's a process, right? It's not just you have one conversation and they hand you a check and it's over. Um, you know, it, it's a much longer process than that where, you know, you, you, you go through a sales cycle and then once they're also a customer, you want to follow up with them continuously. Um, so there was, there was really kind of a gap there that we saw where CRM software served inside salespeople, people who work literally inside at a desk. Um, you know, it, it's, it's very kind of clunky desktop software. It's really hard. Let's say if you're a sales representative, somebody that's out in the field, yeah. maybe, you know, you're visiting, I don't know, 50 restaurants a week or, you know, 20 dentists office a week because you're selling things to these places. Um, the, the, the CRM software really isn't great, right? Like it's not built for mobile. It's not built for being out in the field, um, especially, you know, eight years ago. And, uh, and, and so we kind of saw, okay, maybe we, you know, maybe we could be kind of like a light, you know, not, not even a CRM, but like a front end to their CRM. If we could integrate with their CRM, but, all of the data that they get. So all of a sudden we're, we're essentially geospatializing their CRM data and presenting it in a way that's much more user friendly. Right. Um, and that way, of course, because I'm super biased should be a map. Like there's no doubt about it. You know, people don't want to look at lists, right. When you're in your car trying to figure out how to go from this dentist office to the next one, because you need to sell, you know, this one tool to more dentists you, you don't, you know, you don't want to have to sift, sift through a list and try to figure that out yourself and copy paste into Google maps. Um, so that, that was really our niche. We were like, load your, your customer data into Badger and then we will, you know, essentially help you with routing. So we will help you find, we, we will help you solve the traveling salesman problem to, you know, so you can see 20 to 30 more people a week or something, right? Sell 20 to 30, more percent uh, uh, of, uh, of whatever you're selling. Um, and, uh, and yeah, you know, and, and sure enough, people, you know, our, our customers are salespeople, which is actually really good because they, they're very, they're very, they will tell you exactly what they need to get their job done. Um, and so, you know, we focused on a lot of customer development very early on. We still do. We have really great customer service. Um, because essentially our customers built our product, right? It would be, you know, the, those first, even that first year, it would be like our, our, you know, we, there were three or four of us working there at the time. And, uh, you know, like our sales guy would be on a call talking to a customer and the customer would ask for something. He'd put them on hold. He would just turn to me and he would go, Hey, can we build this? Like they want this. Can we build it? And I would go yeah, sure. Let's, let's give it a shot. And, you know, we'd build kind of a prototype, put that in production and they would say, they'd call the customer back and say, Hey, yeah, it's working now. Do you want to try it? Um, and that would just open more doors to more questions and things like that. So it was very kind of like this rapid, agile, iterative development, which I, which I, I really love that process of like building, right? Like building, building something, uh, is really from scratch like that was really exciting for me. Um, but especially being able to use these geospatial tools, um, you know, and, and really, I, I mean, it was a huge challenge and challenge myself and, you know, cause there's, 
you know, there, there's Esri products have user manuals, right? There's not really a user manual for how to build this very specific startup yeah. and this very specific uses of the technologies. You just kind of have to do a lot of experimentation and trial and error. Um, but again, luckily I, I kind of had that, you know, I, I had that foundation there of, of kind of the, the skill set to really, um, yeah, to really, to really make that happen. So, so it, you know, um, since you've left Arizona and you're well aware of this, that like what in the last decade that the geospatial technologies are just rapidly evolving and changing in, you know, every day, let alone um, how we keep up in higher ed. It's like, we're always behind. That's my honest opinion. And you guys are out there on the cutting you know, the front lines, like putting it to work, putting it into practice. Like what sort of trends do you see or like, how, A, how do you keep up, you know, like with the tech part, not, and then I do understand you have your thematic um, emphasis, customer service, um, you know, and, and that is almost separate where you have to have somebody keeping up with that. But how do you keep up with the techs and what sort of trends are you looking at, you know, like, hey, to be on the front edge, our company's got to be here, you know, or we got to know about this sure. stuff coming down. What do you see as like the gutties? I got to keep up with this and what's going on out there right now? Yeah. I mean, you know, to me, um, to me, what was really useful is finding the kind of the, those, you know, thought or skill leaders in the space. Right. So yes. like come, you know, when, when we were first getting going there, you know, companies like Mapbox, were just coming around um, and they were doing some really interesting things, but more so the engineers that they had there were also doing like really innovative things with kind of these very basic geos, you know, th these basic GIS concepts, right? That like we learned about and that we taught about, um, they were putting them into practice in some really interesting ways and solving real problems of like, you know, the, a very basic problem of how do you display a lot of information in a web browser, um, you know, on a map quickly, right? And you'd, you'd imagine that that would have been solved early on, but it really wasn't. And, you know, even I struggled with that at Badger, um, you know, in terms of like map tiles, right? So, you know, map, map tiles are essentially on the map, the, the pins that you see on the map, it's actually made up of just images. So the server, the server's doing all the work of, of querying the database and, styling those pins in a certain way and then it's just returning image tiles that is like placed nicely on the map the idea being that those image tiles are a lot easier to download on the browser so it's a better like client experience a better user experience you know that those very quickly evolved into vector tiles which was this whole amazing thing to me of like you're actually streaming real data down, you know, down to the, down to the client and displaying that on a map so that it's interactive immediately without having to do a lot of back and forth to the server. Um, you know, and those, and a lot of that research came out of things like Mapbox and, and, you know, some other engineers that, that I kind of looked up to, um, you know, for, for, for a lot of that. And, mm. I, I, in technology, I mean, what I what I have learned is that there's a lot of hype, right? So there's a lot of good PR out there, right? So different, you know, different. There were, I mean, there was a time when there were 12 competing kind of JavaScript ap mapping APIs out there, right? Um, yeah. And and they were all very hyped up, and a new one would come out, and people would get excited, and they'd use it, and things like that. But what I always looked at was like what's actually being used for real products, like in production, real products, right? You know, you see the Google Maps API, um, maybe you'll see like Leaflet, you know, with open street map data, things like that. Um, but, but, you know, there's, when people get it, when, when new technology comes out, people get really excited. There's a lot of innovation and then it kind of dies down a little bit and they're only, you know, and, and the mature choices are the ones that are left. Um, so I've, I've always kind of been cautious on just like jumping on the newest and greatest thing. I mean, I, I love to still experiment with technology and I also encourage my, the whole engineering team um, to experiment with it as well. Um, but, you know, there's always kind of like that sort of like critical eye of, of you know, we're not, we're not going to bet, we, we can't, 
you know, we like, I don't want to bet my whole customer base on some new technology that came out just because it's really shiny and cool. Um, but things that are proven to have like real impact, like real, you know, real performance improvements or user experience improvements. Those, those are the things that I've been really interested in. Um, but yeah, you know, so I try to read a lot of blogs and follow a lot of engineers on Twitter and, um, you know, just, yeah, just kind of, just kind of keep up with a lot of that stuff. Luckily now too, like my, I don't do a lot of coding in my job anymore, you know, so kind of talk about career progression, right? I went from like making maps to putting maps on the internet to building a company that puts maps on the internet, you know, and then now I'm essentially, I've built, I built and now I manage the team that yes. continues to do all that. Um, yeah. So my, my day-to-day job is much more involved in, uh, um, yeah, kind of CTO kind of role yeah. management, people management, um, product management, a lot of that kind of thing. Um, and luckily I, I have a really smart team of about, you know, uh, 18 or so engineers now that, uh, that are, are also really excited about different technology and they, really like to experiment with different things and always looking for ways to improve. So we kind of do a lot of that, like R and D weeks uh, regularly and that kind of thing. Well, that I, that's an interesting point. We've had that in the past talking with some of the leaders in the Arizona GIS community of how you move up in the ranks. And then at some point um, you kind of have to become a manager and a leader for your organization company. And you have to hire the people to do the tech work that you love or used to do. It's sort of a natural progression, but it's that big vision stuff. You know, like what you said, I I love your comment on like, look at applied trends, like look and see what Mapbox, what are the big, what are they doing and what's successful? What's innovative? Who's the real thought leaders? Um, With that in mind, I'm kind of curious and you brought it up for like current students or alumni or people wanting to get, into this kind of developer market area, like what do you look for when you're adding to your tech team, you know, your geospatial, what kind of things do you look for in a person? Yeah. Um, that, I mean that, yeah, that, that's a really good question. And one that's been on my mind, you know, I, I guess up until earlier this year when we were still hiring a bunch of people, um, before, before we got in a pandemic era here, yeah. but yeah, I think, I think, um, you know, to me, it's always been, you know, I, I used to hire a lot on skill, right? Like I used to be like, um, you know, skill is kind of the most important. I want the smartest engineers. I want, you know, I want the smartest tech people. Um, but you know, our, our company is kind of fortunate to have like a really great company culture, you know, San Francisco startups love, love throwing culture around. And to me, it was kind of like, ah, like, what does this mean? You know, like, let's just get smart people to do the work. And that's the end of it. Um, But honestly, it really, it really kind of makes a company more, more successful to have people there who are happy. Right. And, and, and one of the, one of the ways, at least, at least in in tech, um, uh, tech people are motivated by being challenged. So that's cool. And that fits in with the skills, right? If you're a skilled person, you can take on increasingly difficult challenges. Um, But then there's also the other part of having a good company culture, which really just boils down to like, like how people feel about going to work every day, you know, and how people interact with each other and what kind of like, you know, it's what people used to call soft skills, right? Communication skills, working well with others, things like that. But I think that those skills have really become um, more like more and more important, especially now that everybody's kind of working from home, right? Like communication skills have become have become so much more important. If you're sitting in an office, you know, and you're just kind of talking to the person next to you, maybe it's not as important versus now um, people just have to be much more conscious and intentional about their communication. So that, you know, that's that's just one example of that. Um, you know, so uh, along with that, like, it's like, there's like skill and, and sort of this cultural fit, but I I don't really call it talk about, like, I don't really consider cultural fit as much as I consider 
a person's attitude. And I think, I think it, at least in the startup world or the tech world, you really have to be the kind of person that like, isn't afraid to get your hands dirty, that like you seek out problems proactively and you solve them proactively. Mm -hmm. You know, you, 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 uh, you like, you don't really ask permission before you can do something. You just, cause there's always something to do. It's like, okay, if this seems important to you, you know, do some work on it and let's see where it goes. Um, you know, those kind of things, like, like people who aren't perfectionists, people who are, they're, they're okay with good enough because there's all, like, we can always iterate, you know, on, and, and get to perfection eventually, but like getting customer value into a person's hands sooner is always uh, more, more valuable than getting like something perfect into someone's hands later. Um, because there, there's a lot of potential for like waste there. If you don't know what your cust, you don't, you don't really know what your customers need until you've given them something to start with, right? Um, so that you can get feedback from them. Hmm. So you know, it's kind of those, those kind of like, it's almost more like product management skills, honestly, um, or project management skills. Um, you know, being 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 organized and you know looking, looking for challenges, looking to, to be exper you know, looking to experiment in different ways, you know, being open to just trying something new. Um, those, those really to me are almost as important as, you know, can you write code quickly or something, yeah. you know, like, yeah. like, can you test your code, things like that. Like anybody can, anybody coming out of boot camps or out of CS, you know, with CS degrees, they can write code and test code and build stuff. Um, a lot, you know, that it's it's a lot different to be building building something on your own versus building it with a team of people. Um, and, and I think that that's where that's where the magic happens, you know, yeah. is, is working working on things with a team and um, being you know being really passionate and proud of the work you're you're doing. So, is there any like technology out now or on the horizon that you, uh, that you as the CTO are are looking at for your company or just in general that you're kind of like excited to see develop and expand in the marketplace? Yeah, sure. I mean, there's, I, I already mentioned vector tiles. That's, vector that's tiles. still the one that we like, you know, we're, we're still, we're still working on kind of different ways that we could implement that and, and really taking a, a close look at those kind of things. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, aside from that, like, database, you know, not to get too kind of boring and technical, but like database technologies are also evolving. Like Postgres is great, but, yes. um, you know, there, there are a lot of technologies like Mongo and Redis out there now um, that, you know, that, that essentially take a lot of the complexity away from managing databases and that kind of thing. Um, same with like, you know, a lot of, a lot of my job is spent kind of thinking about costs and efficiency and things like that um and so you know i'm always thinking kind of big picture in terms of like platforms right like like what's better amazon web services versus google cloud platform you know versus you know all of the other ones that are out there now there there's so many um you know the, so so many of these infrastructure and platforms as a service uh, that are also really interesting to me that, that there's been a lot of innovation in that space um, that, uh, you know, that, that I, that I think, yeah, I, I'd love to get more into that, but even things like then from that's kind of back end tech, even like the front end tech, right? Like, you know, the, that our, our customers aren't banging down our, our doors for like an Apple watch version of our app or anything. Um, but I can definitely see more of that kind of innovation being really useful, you know, like bringing technology into people's cars, bringing it more, in, you know, directly into their hands um, in different ways and, and solving those day-to-day -day problems. That's really like, that, that, that's really what gets me excited is like yeah. where, where the, the really cool applications of all this technology versus just like, Oh, cool! There's a new update of you know the software, and there's a new tool. It's like, you know, it, it's really the the potential for how those things get used, or what what really, sure. um, really kind of kind of keep me like I guess motivated in tech. You know, um, 
and I'm thinking of your career specifically out of what in my two decades of higher ed of uh, meeting and um, what GIS students and alumni, you are kind of unique in a, in a sense that I would say out of ASU and U of A, you know, what, two thirds of the students go into government types of positions. So it's very mm -hmm. common, very stable work, um, has done well. But, and then of course, uh, businesses, nonprofits as well, but to sure. actually go and, you know, be a part of a startup to start your own company and to have that whole experience is pretty unique, Gutty. And I guess I'm curious, like, if people are podcasters out there listening in, going, geez, I really want to be gutty in my career. I like this idea. What kind of advice would you give those people? Like, I want to create my own thing and do it. Like, where do I get started? You know, they're young. You're excitable. Yeah. Where, what would you Yeah, sure. Yeah, so um, when, you know, when I – kind of when I was in that, that transition from, you know, kind of getting my, getting my hands on web mapping, but I still wasn't like very proficient and maybe I didn't see a lot of the potential in it yet. Um, I, I looked for real world projects and I would just try to chew through them. Right. Yeah. So, you know, and that, that was kind of how I got sort of into the consulting world was because I was, you know, pe pe I was like, hey, I kind of want to build this thing. And people were like, well, if you did, we'd probably give you money for it, you know? And so, I'd, you know, I'd, I would spend a couple of weeks, like, feverishly just trying to figure out how the Google Maps API works, you know, with the info bubbles so I can build this thing and just get something working. Like, take this, I this very simple idea that was in my mind and execute on it until it's tangible. And then then once I have that, go, okay, what's the next idea that I can now add to this and then add that? And you kind of just sort of paint on sort of, you know, you paint, you paint on functionality and at the same time, you're kind of painting on your, you know, your knowledge and your mind um, in sort of these layers. And, you know, and so I guess, I guess that that's the advice that I would give is like, look for real world problems and try to apply the tools that you have to them. Right. And it's and it's and it might suck for a little bit. Like when I first started programming, it, it, it literally it took me like two years probably before I actually felt comfortable with it. Like before I felt like I even knew what I was doing instead of just like copying and pasting code and seeing if it works. Right. Um, really, that light bulb, it, you know, it takes a while uh, to go off, especially like, you know, I didn't have a a CS background or anything like that. It was all kind of coming through GI, you know, the GIS tech world. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, you know, stay, stay curious, like stay hungry, look for, look for those learning opportunities. Just try to, try to, you know, try to apply things in the real world. I mean, that, that was really, uh, that, that was, that was really what kept me going for, you know, for a really long time with that. Yeah. And I think it's important to point out that, your career began where many of others did as well, which was with an internship, you know, just getting out there and um, paid or unpaid. It's just getting that practical real world under your belt. Right. That's a good start. Yeah. Point. Yeah. And, and, you know, we, we've carried that on to our company, right? Like we have a really big, I mean, really big and successful internship program. Um, we get a ton of interns. I mean, dozens of interns a year, uh, all, all across the board, engineering, the business side, sales, you know, everything. Um, just because like I've, I have personally seen how beneficial that is, right? How, how, how beneficial it is to like apply, apply your knowledge that you're learning day to day to, you know, to real world skills. Um, and, and, but I, I would also say do more than just that, right? Like, like if I, if I had just kind of taken my internship at the city of Phoenix and left it at that, I'd probably still be at the city. Um, but, you know, look, look for those doors, like take the, the, you know, look, look for those doors, open them up. Those are going to present more doors, open those doors, see what's interesting to you, you know, try out different things. And uh, um, yeah, I mean, you know, the, the, the tech world isn't 
contracting, it's only expanding. And that's what I learned is that it's, it's much, much bigger than, than just, uh, you know, kind of plain GIS. Like it's, it's much, much bigger. It's, uh, um, you know, it goes, it goes into kind of all facets of IT and the, and the startup world. And, you know, I mean, a, a great example for me is like Uber, right? We think of Uber as like a ride sharing company. They're not, they're a mapping company. Uber is a mapping company, right? Like their, their business model is essentially to gather GIS data for, self, for eventual self-driving cars that they can then lease to companies and things like that, right? Yeah. So, you know, so, so they definitely employ GIS people, you know, like they definitely need people who have geospatial skills and, see, and, and, and solve problems in like geospatial ways. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's it's a it's a, the world is completely different than it was, you know, when I graduated eight years ago, and and yeah. Um, yeah. there's and there's a there's a there's a lot of opportunity. And even when you graduated, what a, what a decade ago, eight years to decade. I remember in your class specifically, it was around that period when we I stopped saying. A decade before that, we used to say the G in GIS is what makes it unique. And I remember, I believe it was even with you that we would have the debate of like, it's not unique, it's ubiquitous is the right you yeah. word now. And yeah. the ubiquity of the geospatial is what is unique or, you know, that gives us that it's everywhere now. That it's, and yeah, there's right. more opportunity to be found. It's just waiting for people to explore. Yeah. And, and I mean, traditionally it's kind of been synonymous with like Esri products or, or yes. kind of this very sort of like, um, you know, th there's like this traditional way of viewing GIS and what it is and who does it and the job titles. Um, but yeah, but it's, you know, it's, it's a, it, it's a set of skills. that's really applicable um, to a lot of, uh, a lot of different career paths and, and uh, yeah. And I'm, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm fortunate. Uh, I feel very fortunate that I was able to like get that under my belt and really enjoy doing it at the same time. And then it kind of took me in this whole other direction that I, I would have never thought of, but has been, uh, um, you know, has, has been really interesting from San Francisco and now living in Spain and running, you know, an engineering team here, all of that has, uh, you know, I, I would have, I would have never thought that when I was in, you know, professor Luke and Beale's class learning, uh, you know, learning, learning how to, you know, merge two polygons or something, you know what I mean? <laughs> yes. Oh, gosh, all those years ago. Well, thank you for joining us today, Gutty. It's been wonderful to have you with us. And we hope that someday when post pandemic that you're in Arizona, or better yet, I'm in Spain, uh, we can get together and share some more of what Badger Maps is up to. Sure. Sounds great. I'd, I'd love to have that opportunity. <laughs> All right. Thank you a lot, Gunny. All right. Thanks for having me.